Let's talk about fission and fusion. All right, here is a plot of, it's showing a bunch of nucleons, the binding energy per nucleon for a bunch of different nuclei. All right, so you take a nucleus, say like uranium-238 over on the far side, you calculate what the binding energy is, right? The difference, if you find the difference in the mass of your, your uranium atom and the mass of the number of protons and neutrons individually it takes to make up your uranium nucleus and multiply that by C squared and that tells you uh, how much energy you'd have to put in to pull your nucleus apart, right? That's the binding energy. So that tells us that uranium-238, right? That binding energy is energy you'd have to put in to get them apart. So the uranium nucleus is a lower energy state than just having a bunch of, of nucleons, right, individually. Now, the higher the binding energy, the lower the st energy state of the system, right? Because the binding energy is the energy we have to put in to get the nucleons apart. So what this plot is telling us then is that iron 56 represents a lower energy state, a more tightly bound uh, bunch of nucleons than uranium 238, right? And uh, lithium 6 is less tightly bound than lithium-7. So lithium-7 represents sort of a lower energy state per nucleon, all right? So if we look at this plot, um, there's some interesting things we see. Uh, first off, notice helium-4 over there. It kind of sticks way out, right? Helium-4 is a very special configuration, right? It's one of these magic numbers where, you know, energy shells are full such that helium-4, the two protons and two neutrons in helium-4 are bound very tightly together. That's why alpha particles get emitted a lot, right? Because that's a very low energy state and a system can oftentimes lower its energy by spitting off an alpha particle, which is very tightly bound, all right? Another thing you'll see right here is that the most tightly bound, the highest binding energy per nucleon is iron-56 right there, left of middle, all right? so. What that is telling us is if we have something to the right of that, like uranium-235, uranium-238, it's possible for that nucleus to split into two smaller nuclei that, are more, that have nucleons that are more tightly bound. So that would be energetically favorable to take a really big nucleus and break it in half. On the other hand, if we look like at hydrogen or helium, you say, well, if I took two of those and stuck them together to make a, one bigger nucleus, that would have more binding energy per nucleon. That would be a lower energy state, a more tightly bound state. So that's energetically favorable. So today we're going to talk about how energy is released when I take a big nucleus and split it in half, or if I take two really light nuclei and stick them together and to make something which is more tightly bound. All right, so let's start with, um, with fission. Fission is when a big nucleus breaks in half. So imagine I have a uranium-235 nucleus, all right? Now, it normally doesn't split apart very often, but imagine a neutron comes along and it absorbs that neutron to become uranium-236. Well, uh, the, it'll be uranium-236 in an excited state and it's likely to split in half, or split not exactly in half, but in two, you know, kind of roughly big chunks. All right, so let's imagine. Now, there's a lot of possibilities, right? If we look at that curve, there are lots of configurations of two big chunks that have more binding energy together than uranium-235 does as one big thing. So let's imagine um, that it splits, all right, into something. Then we look at this and then we say, well, what else? Th there needs to be another nucleus, right? And so we uh, make this split to strontium and xenon. And if we split, if strontium if we get this, this isotope, strontium-86, then, we, you know, we just, the number of protons needs to be the same as we started with, so this needs to add up to 92. And how many neutrons did we have? 235 plus this extra one we grabbed. So these have to add up to 236. So if I make strontium-86, I have to make xenon-150. But that's three times as many neutrons as protons. That's very neutron-rich. That is not stable at all. So it turns out that's not what happens. What happens is we're going to get two more reasonable nuclei 
plus a bunch of extra neutrons, all right? So let's say we made strontium-86 and xenon-132, add them together, that's uh, uh, 8,111 plus 228. So I'm missing eight neutrons, all right? So when fission happens, we tend to have extra neutrons that come flying out. Now remember, heavier nuclei, energetically, we talked about this previously, energetically, it's favorable for them to have more neutrons than protons. For lighter nuclei, it's energetically favorable to have even amounts of protons and neutrons. But as we get to heavier nuclei, the Coulomb repulsion of the protons makes it energetically favorable to have excess neutrons. So the idea is, if I go from a heavy, if I go from a heavy nucleus into two smaller ones, this one has a greater excess of neutrons than these ones will, right, than these two, so we have some extra neutrons left over. Now why is that important? Why is the fact that fission produces neutrons important? Well, first of all, neutrons are dangerous, right? So if you have a fission reactor, you have to worry about those neutrons flying around and hurting things. But those neutrons are also really useful, because like I said, this uranium-235 can sit around for a long time without decaying, but along comes a neutron, bumps into it, and it does fission. All right, so if I have a bunch of uranium around and a neutron bumps into one of my uranium nuclei and makes it split, when it splits, it makes a bunch of other neutrons that then can go and interact with other uranium nuclei. And this is what we call a chain reaction. So you can, once one of them splits, you can get this reaction where a whole bunch of them start splitting. They start splitting faster and faster. All right, so that's a chain reaction. So the idea with the chain reaction is I've got one nucleus, along comes a neutron, it splits into two and then sends off a bunch of additional neutrons, right? And then each of those neutrons, they can hit another one, split it in half, and then they'll send off a bunch of neutrons. And so you can get more and more uh, fission going that way. Now we have this thing called the reproduction factor. And the reproduction factor K basically says from e on average for each fission event that occurs, how many of the neutrons from that event go on to produce another fission event, all right? If K is equal to one, that's what we call a critical reaction, that each reaction, each fission causes another fission, and it just keeps going on and on and on, and I can get very rapid fission going on. If K is less than one, then on average, less than one, each fission event causes less than one fission events after it, right? So there's kind of the naturally occurring fission that's going on, and then I pack all this stuff together, and, and the natural, I, I get a, a fission rate that's faster than the natural rate, but not super fast because, you know, it's not sustaining itself. Whereas if K is equal to one, then every fission event causes another fission event. And if K is greater than one, with each generation, with each step, I get more and more fission, of, of, uh, fission events and makes it run away. So if K is equal to one, we call that a critical reaction. If K is less than one, it's subcritical. It doesn't mean that there's no fission going on. It just means that each fission event causes less than one subsequent events, but that's supplemented by kind of the natural decay. If K is greater than one, this is what we call supercritical. The kind of in each time step, the number of fission events goes up exponentially. All right, so subcritical, critical, and supercritical. Now, what affects the reproduction factor K? What makes it subcritical or supercritical or critical? Well, it turns out, that, of course, the number of released neutrons per fission event affects that. So in the, past ex in the, in the previous example, we saw eight neutrons were, were released. But uranium-235 or any, any given uh, isotope that does fission, it has lots of possibilities. It doesn't always split into the same two things with the same number of neutrons being kicked off. But kind of... If you look at a particular uh, nucleide like uranium-235, you can kind of say, on average, it releases so many neutrons. The more that it releases, the higher the reproduction factor is going to be. There's more neutrons going out there that can cause uh, fission to take place. The absorption cross-section also matters. What is the absorption cross-section? It basically tells us how likely a nucleus is to absorb a, nu a neutron uh, if the neutron flies close by it, all right? Some nuclei effectively have big cross-sections that nu neutrons flying not super close to them will still get, you know, not super close to the center of the nucleus will still get absorbed. Other ones have smaller cross-sections and the neutrons are less likely to be absorbed. 
turns out the cross section depends on the velocity of the neutrons as well. Okay, so the number of released, released neutrons and how close that neutron has to come to the center of a nucleus to be absorbed matter. Is it fissile? If the nuclear material is fissile, the reproduction factor will be bigger. What does it mean for something to be fissile? Well, some nuclei, if they absorb a, absorb a neutron, um, they can just not fall at, fly apart. All right, so they can absorb the neutron and, and not do fission. But if the neutron maybe has enough kinetic energy, when it absorbs the neutron with its energy, it'll end up in an excited state, which makes it split apart. A fissile nuclei is one that if I add a neutron with no kinetic energy, it still will be able to fly apart. Uranium-235, it absorbs a neutron and becomes uranium-236. It turns out that uh, it doesn't have to split apart. Uranium-235 doesn't have to split apart. But just the fact that it has a new neutron, that it just rearranges how things are packed together, even though that neutron doesn't bring in any kinetic energy, creates a uranium-236 atom in an excited state with enough energy that it can fly apart. Sometimes it doesn't do that. Sometimes it'll emit a gamma ray and go down to the ground state of uranium-236, of the uranium-236 nucleus. But just the having the neutron there gives it enough energy that it can split apart. It doesn't need the kinetic energy of the neutron. If you have something that's not fissile, but a neutron can make it split apart, then, you, then only the neutrons that are moving fast enough will cause fission and will contribute to your reproduction factor. Also, if, you can, if only fast neutrons make this work, remember the cross section depends on the velocity and it turns out fast neutrons are harder to hit or harder to, harder to grab. The cross section is smaller for faster neutrons. So if you have something that's not fissile, you have to grab fast neutrons and those fast neutrons aren't as likely to get absorbed. Whereas a fissile material can absorb slow neutrons and still undergo fission. Another thing that affects the reproduction factor is the number and shape of, nu of the number of nuclei and the shape of the mass. So you can imagine if I had a long, thin wire of uranium, most of the neutrons that came out shooting off in some random direction are going to quickly leave the wire and not have much chance to interact with other nuclei. Whereas if I had a sphere of uranium, the neutrons that are emitted have to travel through the thickness of the sphere, and they have lots of chances of interacting with other uranium nuclei. So the shape matters, and how much, right? If I have a little sphere, the neutrons don't have to travel very far to get out of the sphere. If it's a big sphere, they have to travel a long distance. There's lots of opportunities for them to get caught by another nucleus. So when people talk about the critical mass, what they're saying is, if you have enough of this uranium, or whatever material you're using, whatever, if you have enough of this such that <coughs> the reproduction factor is one, that's the critical mass. If you have too little of that material, then the neutrons get out of the material too fast and you can't get a reproduction factor which is critical, which is equal to one. All right, so all of these things affect the reproduction factor. Now, what do I want the reproduction factor to be? Well, it depends on what you're doing. If you're trying to make a nuclear warhead, a bomb, you want it to be really big. You want lots of fission effect, uh, events to happen before the material gets blown apart and the, and the nuclei are, are too far apart to sustain a chain reaction anymore. So you want the, the decays to go really, really fast, all right? the fission to go really fast. If you're building a nuclear power plant, you definitely do not want K to be bigger than one. You do not want your fuel rods to explode. So you want it to be less than one, but you probably want it to be somewhat close to one because you want to produce a lot of energy. If K is really small, then your fuel just gets mildly warm like it does you know, when it's in the ground as uranium ore. You want to pack the uranium close enough together that you get this uh, chain reaction going on so that more heat is made, more energy is released, and your power plant can produce a lot of power. All right, so uh, how do you control the reproduction factor? Um, this is a drawing of the first man-made nuclear reactor. All right, turns out nature made one a long, long time ago that we discovered uh, churned up some interesting isotopes. But this is the first man-made nuclear reactor. And uh, this was made by Enrico Fermi's team during the Manhattan Project during World War II. And what they did is they stacked up a bunch of uranium and they packed uh, stuff around them to, to shield the radiation so that everyone in the room didn't die. Um, 
And then they needed to control how fast the reaction happened. So they would put they put in what we, we call control rods. So rods made of a material that is really good at absorbing neutrons. If you put that material in there, it absorbs the, a lot of the neutrons before they can go and cause more fission events and you can reduce the reproduction factor. So by pulling the control rods out, you can make the reproduction factor bigger. By putting them in further, you can lower the reproduction factor. Now, it turns out um, it's, it can be hard to get a reproduction factor which is close to or greater than one, all right, with naturally occurring uranium. So a lot of times you worry about how can you make this reproduction fast, uh, factor bigger. Um, one thing you can do is thermalize your neutrons. So I mentioned that the cross-section for neutron absorption tends to be much bigger if the neutrons are moving slower. When you have a fission event, these neutrons come out with lots of energy <coughs> and they're moving really fast. You want to slow them down. A, a way to slow them down is to have them bounce off of other stuff, right? They're coming out very fast. Um, so their velocity is not a Maxwell-Boltzmann thermal distribution at room temperature. You would like them to be that. And so what you do is you let your neutrons bump into different things and come into thermal equilibrium with the surroundings such that the neutrons are moving slower. Now, what would be the best thing for a neutron to collide with if we want it to thermalize quickly? What should we make the neutron collide with? Well, I don't know. I have no idea. What am I supposed to think about, Dr. Durfee? Well, consider this. What if I had a ping pong ball run into a bowling ball? Would the bowling ball slow the ping pong ball down much? No, the ping pong ball would just reflect right off of it, come out with about the same velocity it went in with. Now consider a bowling ball hitting a ping pong ball. It would just plow right through the ping pong ball, wouldn't slow down very much. So if you want to slow your neutrons down, the best thing is to have it collide with something with about the same mass. What has the same mass as a neutron? Well, a neutron, sure. Where are you going to get a bunch of neutrons, uh, bare neutrons? How about a proton? Protons are almost exactly the same mass as neutrons. If you had a bunch of protons in there, the pro they could bounce off the protons and slow down. Where are you going to find a bunch of protons? Well, hydrogen is just a proton and an electron, right? So a hydrogen atom has a little proton in there that's just prime for slowing neutrons down. And, uh, well, we don't probably want a lot of hydrogen gas in our nuclear reactor because gas leaks out easily, and if it's ignited, it explodes, all right? But what if we put water around our reactor core, put water near our fuel rods? Water has lots of hydrogen in it, all right? So we run water. A lot of nuclear reactors will run water through them, and they'll use the water to extract the heat from the nuclear reactor, make steam, drive a turbine, and so forth to generate electricity. As the water goes through though, is the water cooling off or is it heating up the reactor? So the water's taking heat away, so in a sense it's cooling it off, but the presence of the water makes the reactions happen faster. So if your nuclear power plant is getting too hot, you probably don't want to flow more water through it. As you flow the water through, it, it makes steam and you get steam pockets in there where it's less dense. If you run the water faster, those steam pockets get smaller, there's more water near your fuel, and actually the reactor will heat up. Kind of counterintuitive, because water acts as a very good moderator to thermalize the neutrons. Okay, so now if we're making a power plant and we want to make the reproduction factor close to one, how do we do that? Well, it turns out for natural uranium, now naturally occurring uranium is made up of mostly uranium-238 and a little bit of uranium-235. Uranium-235 is fissile, Uranium-238 is not. So it turns out uranium-238 will absorb slow neutrons without undergoing fission. So they're just a loss of neutrons. Uranium-235 is fissile, but only about 82% of the time will a uranium-235 atom undergo fission when it absorbs a neutron. The other times, it will absorb the neutron, become uranium-236 in an excited state, and then give off its energy as a gamma ray and become a more stable nucleus that doesn't split in half. So because of that, because of the absorption from 238 and 235 not undergoing fission every time, it turns out if you have pure natural uranium, a natural mixture of these two isotopes, pure, pure uranium, a gigantic huge chunk of it, the maximum reproduction factor you get is 1.32, which is just a little bit above one. And then any additional loss of neutrons reduces the reproduction factor. You know, what if you don't have an infinite sized chunk of it? 
What if there are other things in there? What if you want some control rods in there to absorb things? What if you have to have, um, right, you have your water going through to thermalize the neutrons. Sometimes the water will absorb the neutrons. The hydrogen will absorb a neutron and become deuterium, and the deuterium will absorb a neutron and become tritium. All right, so all of these losses make it really hard to get a reproduction factor very close to one in a nuclear power plant. So how do you deal with that? One thing you can do is to enrich your uranium. Naturally occurring uranium is about 0.7% uranium-235. If you can enrich it, you know, get rid of some of the 238, and get it up to about 3%, that's good for a typical nuclear power plant. So uh, if you're following the news and what's going on in Iran, that's kind of the, the, the fuss over their um, uranium isotope a a separation. They claim they're trying to make nuclear power plants, right? In which case, they need to enrich it up to about 3%. But once you have the technology to do that, you don't have to stop at 3%, and you can enrich it more and make uranium, which is uh, got enough uranium-235 to make an effective nu nuclear bomb, right? So enriching uranium is oftentimes used for energy production. There's another approach, which is to use heavy water. I mentioned that one of the big losses of neutrons is they get absorbed by the hydrogen in the water. But if you have water that already has tritium and deuterium atoms instead of hydrogen atoms, so tritium and deuterium are really hydrogen, they're isotopes of hydrogen with special names. But if you use heavy water where your hydrogens already have extra neutrons and they can not absorb mo more neutrons, they don't thermalize as well, but they still thermalize pretty well and uh, you get less loss of neutrons. So that's one way to uh, make a nuclear power plant. And where do you get heavy water from? Well, one way to do it is to run water through a regular nuclear power plant until it's absorbed a lot of neutrons, I guess. All right, and then once you've figured out a way to get it up to about one, how do you make sure it's right where you want it to be? And that's, you use control rods. You put things down in between the fuel rods that can absorb neutrons, and you pull them out or push them in in order to absorb fewer or more neutrons and control the rate of reactions in your reactor. All right, this is a picture of a place called Craters of the Moon. It's up in Idaho. Really cool place. It's this big lava flow. They've got caves and things you can climb through. This is my wife and two of my kids many years ago when we went and visited, visited Craters of the Moon. All right, and it turns out very close by Craters of the Moon, there's the world's first nuclear power plant, all right? Not the first reactor, but the first one that actually produced electricity and powered a city for a little while, all right? This is uh, Experimental Breeder Reactor 1, EDR1, and it's open to the public. You can go and take tours of it. It's, it's pretty cool. So if you're in the area, you should go see it. But here's, uh, you walk in and they show you a diagram of how it all works. Here on the left, you see there's the nuclear fuel. It's got the control rods that control how fast fission is going on. They don't use water, they didn't use water in this plant to pull the energy out. They actually used liquid metal. And that liquid metal would go through a heat exchanger and exchange its heat with another liquid metal circuit. Why? Because that liquid metal absorbs neutrons and becomes radioactive. So the next liquid metal loop, um, it uh, is not interacting directly with the fuel. It's interacting with the previous liquid metal. So it's only a little radioactive and the second phase of liquid metal only gets a little bit radioactive. And then that second stage of liquid metal then goes through a heat exchanger with water. The water gets heated up, makes steam, and turns a turbine, turbine which makes electricity. Okay, so here's a picture. That big, uh, the big uh, cement, sorry, brick and concrete thing here. This is actually the reactor. So there's all the shielding here, and the fuel rods get put right down the center there, and the cool control rods run in between there. This thing right here is a big lead shield. The fuel rods are stored in concrete down here when you need to take a fuel take a fuel rod out that's spent and store it or pick up a fresh one and put it in you use this big lead shield to do that you pull it up inside here then a crane brings it up here and you can lower your fuel rod into the reactor this is the control panel in the control room where they control what's going on um, this button right here is labeled SCRAM that stands for safety control rod axe man so back in the first reactor that I showed you, the, the drawing of, that Enrico Fermi and his gang put together to, to do experiments on nuclear physics, um, the control rods were connected to ropes, and there was a guy with an axe. He was the safety axe man, the safety control rod axe man. If things went wrong, he was supposed to hit that rope with the axe, break it, and have the control rods fall as fast as possible. All right, in EBR1, there's not a guy with an axe. 
it's all automated, but this button shares the name. All right, you push that button, the control rods fall down in. Now this reactor is not active right now, so you, you know, don't have to worry about that. But when it was running, they had that the panic button right there. All right, and here's the turbine, the turbine that the steam would turn, and which would turn and turn turn the generator and produce electricity. All right, so there's a really cool uh, reactor you can go look at if you want. Um, breeder reactors. You've probably heard people talk about breeder reactors. I'm going to tell you what that's all about. So remember, uranium-238, it's kind of a problem in our reactor because it absorbs neutrons, but it doesn't undergo fission. That's really annoying. However, it's not all bad because when uranium-238 absorbs the neutron, it becomes uranium-239. That little asterisk means that it forms in an excited state. Having the neutron there gives it extra energy, right? The binding energy, all right? Well, it turns out after about, with a half-life of about 24 minutes, uranium-239 will decay by beta minus decay into neptunium-239. And then with a half-life of about 2.3 days, neptunium-329 will decay to plutonium-239. And guess what? Plutonium-239 is fissile. So if you put a bunch of uranium in your reactor, the uranium-235 is fissile. And some of its neutrons go on to make other uranium-235 atoms split, but some of them get absorbed by uranium-238. But those that get absorbed by 238 then convert the uranium-238 into fissile plutonium-239. And so you actually end up with more fissile material than you started with, which is kind of cool. That's what they call it a breeder reactor. You're making more fuel as the uranium-235 is being burned. All right, this is really cool because you can take your not fissile uranium-238 and turn it into something which is fissile, which helps your reactor have generate more energy, you know, per pound of uranium you put in there. One problem with breeder reactors is it's really hard to extract uranium-235 from uranium-238 because they are chemically the same. They have a tiny, tiny mass difference, and you have to use that to separate the two, and that's a difficult and slow and cumbersome expensive technology. Plutonium does not exist in nature. Plutonium only shows up when you generate it in a reactor. Uh, if you ever hear about someone mining plutonium, they're making something up, all right? So what does that mean? It means if you run your nuclear reactor for a while and you churn up all this plutonium, you can pull your fuel rods out and chemically extract plutonium. So this is an easier way for somebody to make a nuclear bomb. So one of the problems with breeder reactors is it makes it a lot easier for nuclear weapons proliferation. All right, so nuclear power pros and cons, uh, specifically fission power is what I'm talking about here. The great thing about fission is it's clean energy. You don't produce greenhouse gases like you do when you burn fossil fuels. Nuclear energy is very cheap, all right? And nuclear energy can be done safely if properly regulated. Now, nothing is ever 100% safe, right? Um, but like a coal burning plant, it's guaranteed not to be safe because it's automatically blowing carbon dioxide and pollutants into the air, right? The nice thing about nuclear power is unless there is an incident, um, all the radioactive stuff is contained. You're not making greenhouse gases. You're not throwing pollution into the air, all right? It can run at very high temperatures, which means your Carnot efficiency is really high, right? And so nuclear power has a lot of great advantages to it. And you, but you do have to be very careful with it, right? Because it has a potential to go wrong. You have to worry about radioactivity. Um, so far in the history of nuclear power, there has been very little problems with radioactivity getting out into the world, all right? Um, the tsunami in Japan was one incidence of some radioactive stuff getting out, but honestly, very few people have died. There's been very few health, negative health effects due to nuclear power compared to other types of power. But there is the question of, you know, well, what do you do with the radioactive stuff? We have perfectly good ways of storing it, but we have this not in my backyard attitude, which is keeping us from storing radioactive waste in a safe way. So there's a problem. If there's a disaster, right, and you get this radioactivity spread, that's something you have to worry about. And if you have nuclear power plants around, they're churning up plutonium, which makes it easier for people to make nuclear bombs. And if you have people enhance enriching uranium for nuclear power plants, how much harder is it to enrich it to make a nuclear bomb? So those are some of the pros and cons of nuclear power. There's pluses, but there's minuses, all right? You need to inform yourself about these, about nuclear power, um, and not have a knee-jerk reaction, because 
Nuclear power is inevitable. We are using power on this world at greater and greater rates, and fossil fuels are getting more expensive and harder to find. Um, the pollution we're making with them are becoming more and more of an issue. And frankly, we just can't produce electricity fast enough. So it's inevitable that nuclear power is going to grow in the future. I, I, most experts will say that there's just no foreseeable way that we're not going to have to increase nuclear power in the future. All right? It's clean and can be done safely and environmentally responsibly. Furthermore, it accounts for about 20% of our electricity in America today. All right? We have not built a nuclear power plant for in America for decades because people have been afraid of nuclear, but older power plants continue to produce about uh, one-fifth of our power, one-fifth fifth of our electricity today. And eventually, we're going to have to build new ones, and, and that's going to have to increase. In Europe, it's used a lot more. For example, 80% of France's electricity comes from nuclear power. We need to get past this a notion of not in my backyard. Yes, uh, the first step is to become comfortable and say, okay, I can see that nuclear power can be done effectively and safely. We should do it. And then you have to be willing to have it done in your state, right? And so there's some obstacles to it, but I think it's inevitable. We love power too much to not use nuclear power. So you should know about it. All right. Now we're going to talk about fusion, when we combine two nuclei to form a heavier nucleus, all right? Um, this is what powers stars. So for example, in younger stars, the type of fusion that occurs mainly is hydrogen-hydrogen fusion. I have two protons that come together to form a deuteron, right? So what happens is these two protons come together. The two protons alone are not stable in a nucleus, but one of them, as they come together in the process, one of the protons does beta plus decay. It emits a positron to become a neutron, and you're left with a deuteron, a deuterium nucleus, plus a positron and um, a neutrino. All right, and then that positron. Okay, so that gives off some energy because the the bind because of the binding energy. The the stuff you are left with weighs less than what you started with. And then in addition, that positron is going to find that extra electron. Right, you used to for every proton you have an electron. Now one of your protons turns into a neutron, you've got a spare electron around, right? This positron will find one of these electrons and annihilate, and you get then that energy as well. And that's what powers young stars, all right? So mass before minus mi mass after is the energy released, all right? Um, once you have a bunch of this deuterium around, there's other reactions that can happen. For example, a deuteron and a proton can combine together to make helium-3, and that gives off some energy. And then once you have some helium-3 around, you can have protons bump into helium-3 to make helium-4 plus a positron and a neutrino. And that gives off more energy. So there's lots of fusion processes that can happen. All right? It's unlikely for two deuteriums to bump into each other because there's a lot more hydrogen, right? Um, it's unlikely for two helium-3s to bump into each other because there's a lot more hydrogen. But eventually the hydrogen starts to burn out and you start to run out. So in an older star, you've got all this helium-3, not so much hydrogen, and eventually helium-3 atoms or nuclei start bumping into each other to make helium-4, all right? Um, plus more hydrogen that can then go on and do its own thing. So these are just some examples of things that happen in stars to fuel stars, all right? Now what if we wanted to do the same thing on Earth to generate electricity? There are people working on this, commercial fusion energy, all right? What does it take to make it go? Well, in order to get two protons or two deuterons or whatever, whatever you want to fuse together, to fuse, you have to get them close together, all right? You do not have to get them exactly on top of each other because tunneling will allow them to kind of come together and bond together, all right? But you have to get them very close for tunneling to take effect, and that is hard because nuclei have positive charges, right? The electric charge repels them. So you need a lot of kinetic energy. They need to be moving really fast so that they can get together close enough to tunnel and have the fusion go before they push each other apart, all right? So if you make a nuclear reactor on Earth, you need to get your hydrogen or your deuterium or your tritium or whatever you're fusing really, really hot. But if it's really, really hot, it also wants to fly away, right? Fly apart. And that's bad because you need them to bump into each other. You need to keep density up. So you need you need kinetic energy, you need heat. You also need density. You need to hold them together. And you need to hold them together for long enough for something interesting had to happen. So you need time as well. So you need a way to heat up your nuclei really hot and hold them together 
for a long time. And so that's what, that's what makes this really hard, and that's what people have been working on. All right, so one reaction that occurs in a hydrogen bomb and is one that we like to use in energy plants is to take a deuterium and a tritium and whack them together. Why deuterium and tritium instead of hydrogen and hydrogen? Well, hydrogen is more common, right, and more easier to come by, but it's also lighter. It has less inertia, so it's harder to get them to come together, all right? So it's easier to do with heavier stuff. Um, if I take a deuterium and a tritium nuclei, whack them together, I can make helium-4 plus a neutron, all right? And in that process, each time that happens, you get 17.6 mega electron volts out, all right? So that's the idea. So how do you make a fusion reactor? Well, okay, before we talk about that, let's talk about the advantages of fusion reactors. There's much less radioactivity. Your fuel is not radioactive, or not very radioactive, depending on what you use. You don't have to have the radioactive decay happening. You're pushing them together, all right? Um, the waste you're left with, right? If we do this reaction here, you're left with helium, helium-4. It's perfectly inert. You can fill up balloons with it and have parties, right? So you don't have the nuclear waste. Um, most of it produces helium-4. Of course, things near the reactor can absorb neutrons and become radioactive, but you have much less radioactive waste to deal with, all right? You don't have, I mean, hydrogen is everywhere, right? The fuel is abundant. Um, also, you're not churning up plutonium, you're not dealing with uranium, you're not making things or dealing with things that can easily be turned into weapons, all right? The problem with it is it doesn't work yet. It's a really hard problem. People have been working on it for a long time. These protons repel each other until you get them really close. So you need a lot of energy, you need a lot of heat, a lot of confinement, and some time to make this happen, and that's really hard. Um, it's uh, a common saying that fis commercial fusion power is just 20 years away, and it has been for the last 60 years. Anyway, but hopefully someday we'll make this work. All right, so. Different ways to do this, plasma fusion is one way, all right? And you, basically, usually in plasma fusion, you confine your nuclei with a magnetic field and then get it really hot. You heat it up, say, with radio waves or microwaves, and then <coughs> the fusion starts to happen. Uh, some terms they use, break even means I'm putting energy in to heat up my plasma, and that energy's getting away, right? It's, it, you know, eventually leaks away. Am I getting enough fusion going on so that I'm getting out as much energy that I put in, right? To make a commercial power plant, you need to get out more than what you put in, all right? So break even is when you're just barely putting in enough, uh, you're barely get, you're getting out enough to equate what you're putting in. So you want to get above break even. A better point to get is what we call ignition. Once you reach ignition, the idea is that the energy is being contained well enough that the energy from fusion events is enough to create more fusion events, you're containing it well enough so that once you get it going, you don't have to keep putting heat in to make the fusion keep going. Here's an example of a, uh, a test reactor that was built to try and understand the challenges of a commercial fusion reactor. You can see it's quite big. Uh, what you see here, it's kind of a round shape. There's a vacuum chamber in there shaped like a donut, and there's a magnetic field that goes around the donut that confines the plasma inside of there uh, for commercial fusion, all right? And, uh, well, to explore the possibilities of commercial fusion. Um, there's another approach to fusion, and that is, well, there's several approaches. One other approach is what we call inertial confinement fusion or laser fusion. The idea is here, I've got this big vacuum chamber. Here it's under construction, but the idea is lasers come in from all kinds of dif different directions, and they focus in on a little pellet containing deuterium, and the laser power compresses the deuterium and heats it up. And it heats it up really fast so that the fusion happens before there's time for the um, stuff to fly away. And the idea was trying to make fusion that way. My understanding is most efforts in inertia confinement fusion have kind of tapered off. It's not looking very profitable. Now the, 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 these giant facilities that explored it, now they're being used for different experiments in nuclear physics, but my understanding is uh, it's not looking very likely that this is going to, in any reasonable time scale, turn into a commercial energy producer. But it's still a really cool experiment. Um, here's another picture from the same uh, experiment called the National Ig uh, Ignition Facility. They have a big room. This is part of this room. It's uh, the size of several ba uh, football fields. 
filled with giant lasers. This is a big laser amplifier that amplifies all this light that goes and then focuses down on the deuterium pellet to make fusion. And they do get fusion in these reactors, it's just they don't think they can do it where they're getting more energy out than what they're putting in. So but they can create fusion and they use it for different tests of of radioactivity and you know how nuclear bombs go off and things so they can do controlled experiments in it. There are also other really cool practical uses of nuclear physics. Uh, nuclear physics is used a lot in medicine. Um, nuclear treatment. Um, so you have a cancerous tumor, uh, a really good way to deal with that is to ingest a chemical which is attracted to that tumor, which will cling to that tumor, that then has some radioactive isotopes and the radiation coming out of that will destroy the tumor. You can also use radioactive materials to image something. You can put some radioactive stuff in, have it go, you know, somewhere, and then you can measure the radioactive stuff coming out. For example, a PET scan. PET stands for positron emission tomography. So you put a beta plus emitter, a positron emitter, goes somewhere in your body, all right? The positrons come out, they bump into electrons, they make a pair of gamma rays that shoot off in opposite directions. And then by measuring both of those gamma rays synchronously, you can tell where they came from and you can map out in three dimensions, you know, where that uh, stuff is. Uh, an MRI scan does not involve radioactivity, all right? So if you go and get an MRI, there is nothing radioactive there, but it does involve the nucleus. So understanding how the nucleus works made it possible for MRI scans to, to work. And the basic idea with an MRI scan is that the, the nucleus in various atoms has a magnetic moment, and you can make that magnetic moment flip up and down. It has resonances, and you can use those resonances to detect where those nuclei are. And so you can, you know, tune to a hydrogen resonance and find where hydrogen is in your body, for example, and make a three-dimensional scan. All right, nuclear materials are used as power for space probes. You spend a, send a probe out, you know, to the edge of the solar system. It takes a long time to get there. If you try and power it with a gasoline engine, you know, you have to bring your oxygen along as well, right, to make that work. It's, it's not going to last very long. But if you put a chunk of, you know, uranium that gets kind of warm that then... Uh, generates electricity with a Peltier device, for example, you can have a fuel source that can produce moderate amount of electricity for long time. So it's really useful. We talked about radiocarbon dating. Understanding nuclear physics can help you understand how old things are. Radiation is really useful for sterilization of things. You can sterilize food with radiation. You can do it in a way in which the food does not become radioactive, but it does become sterile. You can get rid of the bacteria so that it will store for a long time. And there's just all kinds of uses of radioactivity. Another example is smoke detectors. Most smoke detectors have a little piece of americium, which emits alpha particles. And when those alpha particles bump into uh, smoke particles, you can detect that the smoke is there. And that's how a lot of smoke detectors work. And this is very, very low level alpha emitter, so it's not really dangerous, but it is really useful. Okay. Um, here's just another really fun application I found in nuclear physics. Some um, people were trying to kind of examine paintings, you know, kind of get below the surface of paintings. So they did uh, what they call neutron activation. So here's an example. They took Van Dyck's uh, St. Rosalie interceding for the plague stricken of Palermo. And they irradiated it with neutrons. Not so much that this thing is like glowing in the dark and going to kill everyone, right? But just put a little bit of neutrons in there and then they uh, measured the electrons that were emitted and they were able to image where the electrons were coming from. Incidentally, I do not know the copyright in this image. I'm invoking fair use here, but it comes from this presentation which you can go and look at online. It's got more information. But here's the cool thing. They rated with the neutrons. That causes some of these nuclei to become radioactive and then undergo beta minus decay and emit electrons. And by measuring where the electrons came from, you could make an image of what was underneath the picture. And what you can see here is, ah, the picture was repaired at some point. Part of this paint is an original, all right? You can also see there's a, there is a umber. So there's an underpaint, underpainting here. After a little bit longer, the, um, the uh, manganese has all decayed away, but phosphorus, which exists in charcoal, takes, has a longer half-life, and eventually you're looking just at this phosphorus, and you can see that he did a, a charcoal drawing on this canvas before reusing it. You can see it's upside down. There's a person there before re reusing it to do this painting. So interesting things revealed by nuclear physics. 
Um, here's another example, Jackson Pollock's painting, Galaxy. You irradiate that and you find this hidden message that he put in there. Um, I'm kidding. I made this up. This is a joke. The, the previous one was real. This is just for fun. Anyway, that's nuclear physics. Now, unfortunately, we don't have more time in this class to go into all of the wonders of modern physics. We're kind of stopping at nuclear physics. So much has been done, and we've learned so much, and there's all kinds of crazy things out there. But I'm going to, for lack of time, I'm going to have to let you go discover them on your own. Particle physics. It turns out protons, neutrons, electrons, neutrinos, and their antiparticles are not the only things out there. And uh, there's all kinds of crazy things. Quarks. My favorite, the strange quark. All right? All kinds of interesting things in particle physics. And by exploring particle physics, we can learn about the universe and how it came into being and whatnot. Quantum chromodynamics describes the forces that hold uh, nuclei together. There's this thing we call the standard model, which is basically kind of trying to wind together everything we know about physics. It's kind of Newton's second law, but for uh, a new generation. Unfortunately, the standard model is not as simple as F equals MA, and it's got a lot of kind of duct tape tweaking parameters and things in there. And so everybody knows that the standard model is not the end of everything. There must be a better, more fundamental theory that we eventually have to find. All right, there's a bunch of unification theories, all right, that try and unify the forces that show that the different forces are the same, are different faces of the same thing. We've been able to, for example, show that electricity and magnetism are really two faces of the same thing. And we've been able to show that electromagnetism and the weak force are just two faces of the same thing. And there are people working on theories trying to combine all of them together. One of these theories of everything is known as string theory. And in string theory, all particles and everything are described as little vibrations on 11-dimensional strings. All right, weird, wacky stuff. All right, so there's just so much to modern physics that we don't have time to cover. I hope you are inspired to go and read more, learn more about modern physics, because there's some really cool, mind-boggling things to learn.